It's the Swole Patrol. We have a guest who is so super buff. He has more abs than all of Colombia. And he's a brown belt, so he can choke you out. He's not just a pretty face and muscles. He can move real well, so you watch your mouth. Or the Persian prince of being buff will kick your dick off and make you submit and tap out. Yeah. Wow. He, it's not like he wrote that. It's no, like, that just came out no, of his head. Just, that's so it just, funny. It I just was, happens. Until I looked up, I thought that was a recording. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's because of the melodious tones of Mike Catherwood. You need an album. Uh, no, it, it would. Well, maybe. Drew says nope. No, no, no. May, I, well, I don't want anything planned. You know what I mean? I. But it's string, never good. But stringing together a series of your spontaneous discharges like that. It's yeah. never good when I uh, plan it. Um, good. Anyway. It's, yeah. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Swole Patrol podcast. Our guest today is a uh, professional competitive figure athlete and also a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. It's very impressive. The man is not only a personal trainer to everyday folks who want to get in shape. He's also a personal tra- strength and conditioning coach to some of the best athletes in the world, including uh, former heavyweight champion of the UFC, Mr. Fabrizio Verdum. Uh, I've seen you working with Anderson Silva. Yeah. The, many consider him to be the greatest of all time. And he is a brown belt in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. He is a very, very impressive athlete and a uh, very astute fitness mind, too. Not just, uh, not just a guy who looks the part. He definitely knows what he's talking about. And I'm very excited to have Mike Safai on the show today. Welcome, dude. Thank you so much. I feel uh, greatly honored to be here. Thanks, dude. Uh, awesome I, um, as I said, there's a there, look. I work out at Gold's Gym in Venice, so I, I'm no stranger to seeing guys who have really impressive physiques. But um, you impress me in the sense that uh, I follow you on social media, at Mike Safai on, uh, on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and uh, you, have a very, um, you have a very good insight into um, not only uh, getting shredded, but also into maintaining functional and, and um, useful mobility. Which is not something that oftentimes comes part and parcel with guys who have great physiques. You know, it's usually one or the other. Um, did you start off wanting to be uh, a physique competitor and then got into athletics, or were you got, uh, always a gifted athlete and then just found like, oh, I can be shredded too? Actually, I started um, at seven years old. My father, interesting man, you know, very educated. Uh, he has 14 kids. Um, what? Whoa! Yeah. Long story. I didn't even know what polygamy was until I saw <laughs> oh my. Big Love. But yeah. it's interesting. So he uh, started us running at seven years old. And I'm 39 years old now. So I was really good at like the 5K and the 10K. But I was in preparation before I left my father at 11 to uh, train for the Junior Olympics for the mile. Because I, w- I ran a 555 mile in elementary school. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so, but we were running, and that was the rule. I mean... Before you left your father? Yes, I left my father. I grew up in NorCal, and I left my father. My mom, I, my father started running us at seven. My mom kind of disappeared for whatever reason. Uh, They didn't get along, and then at 11 years old, my mom came back in the picture, and I was just like... Wait, wait, wait. There's way more going on here. (laughs) 14 kids? Yes, 14 kids. So your mom was one of the moms? From four women, and at one time... Four women, all living together at the same time? No, not all four, but... uh, But did that that series Big Love characterize the kind of interpersonal sort of dynamics of what goes on? Uh, Only the uh, sleeping arrangements. My dad was basically the king of his fortress. It was very interesting. How did he pull that off without legal issues? Um, You know, I don't... It's interesting because legally, you can have as many girlfriends as you want. So they weren't married to anybody? No. There's like the religious married thing. But there was that one time, three women, their sibling rivalry. I mean, I remember the oldest group or tribe, like uh, they would become abusive to... Our tribe, it would uh. call my dad, dad. So it's a, you know, we were, we grew up in a survival state. That's intense. It's like Lord of the Flies. That's amazing. It really was. And uh, we were younger. They were a lot older. But, you know, eventually. Um, it, was a, it was a primate pod. It's, it, it was crazy. And I, and I didn't know it then. You know, you just, you grow up. Sure. And, it, what, well, everything is, is how it should be to a kid. Yes. Correct. You know? Whatever everything it is. It's just how it should be. Yeah. But I was really good at um, enduring discomfort. And that's what running is. Mm. And so I was, 
you know, on my way. Training, you know, was very, very strict. Corporal punishment. If you walked in front of the TV when the 49ers were playing, you had to run 20 laps. Oh, That's my God. That's like you ran three to six miles Monday through Saturday. You rest Sunday and then you repeat. So there well, was, did he treat the boys and the girls equally? That, that one? you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, ironically, we weren't. My dad didn't treat the girls like boys. He treated his kids like soldiers. Mm. You ate at a certain time. You couldn't go to the cabinet. There was no TV unless you watch what he watched was like MacGyver uh, at that time CNN. Um, and it was my sister. I, I grew up with powerful women. This is, like, this is like Sparta. It's, it's, it really like, it's it really was. Like, like, yeah. you, know you know what it sounds like is like when you talk to Yoel Romero or, or Khabib, like growing up in camps, in, yeah. in, in athletic camps, yeah. is as if you grew up in one. Yeah, it's in, in, I, that's why some things, uh, I guess, trigger me a little bit more than others. And it's usually adversity. Yeah. Uh, but my sisters are very powerful people, mentally and physically. They used to stick up for me, you know, when guys would pick on me. Um, and my dad's very philosophical. I remember, like, he would, when, you know, he's walking with his kids and his dog, and he goes, kids, come over here. And he grabs these, these vines, and he breaks one. He goes, look. And then he grabs a whole bunch, and then he goes, look. And we're like, oh, you know, we're, I'm like eight years old. He goes, well, we can do it, Dad. And he goes, look, if you guys stick together, no matter what, you can't break. You're unbreakable, yeah. And then there was another instance where it's like, look, you see this? And he pokes you with his finger. And he goes, now look at this. And he punches you with a closed fist. He goes, when you're together, you're always stronger. And that bred us the framework of my mindset to be this protective brother to where when I did come over here with my mom, right? Over here. Uh, L.A. Hmm. From uh, NorCal to L.A., Saratoga to Los Angeles. I became the man of the house. And... You know, we had this. My father, my youngest brother would ask. Um, I mean, at that time, I was a believer in um, a deity, but he would ask, who do you love more, dad or God? That was the comparative narrative. And I'd be like, shut up. Like, I don't even want to have to think about that because you weren't supposed to love sure. it. Sure, But like, I mean, so you're literally comparing your father to a God. Hmm. Then you come over here. And then my mom, single woman, five kids, um, God, five kids. Five kids were all under one roof. At one time, it was a two-bedroom condo. The girls got the room. The boys slept together in the living room. Um, I tried to uphold the running legacy. Through that time, it just didn't work out because we weren't forced to. There was Nintendo, and I can eat whenever I wanted to. I right. mean, one of the first gifts of moving here was, you know, uh, back in the day when they had commercials and you saw, like, cereal, you would see – because they're trying to show like the vitamin content of it. You'd see orange juice and a glass of milk with a bowl of cereal. And I just thought that that's just the way people that were allowed to do it did it. So I used to have my orange juice and my cereal and all that. And like, I tried to set it up like they did like a commercial because you, you didn't, you weren't allowed to do that. But growing up, you know, I realized that my mom, she was, she was the fucking one. I mean, I don't know if I can yeah, yeah. guess. Yeah. She was the fucking one. I remember uh, I trained Carrie Walsh for a little bit, uh-huh. right? And she's very close to our family. A beautiful, beautiful person. Um, not, I'm not just saying that either. She was like, so what do you think you learned from your mom? Because my dad's just, you know, he has a PhD in computer science, you know, from UCLA. He's very philosophical, right? And, you know, he trained us to be this thing. And I was like, my mom gave me my balls. I mean, literally. And what I mean by that is, I'm only as brave as I am because of my fucking mom. Yeah. I remember her standing up to my dad for the first time. I remember when, I mean, I went to 13 schools in six years, you know? Whoa, that is chaos. Well, yeah, I mean, I was diagnosed ADHD later in my life. They didn't even know what that was in the early 80s, apparently. But yeah, so and I remember, this is a true story. I would, even at fault, my mom would go in there and uh, that vice principal, he's pushing the last number in his face because he just knew my mom <laughs> doesn't matter. She's going to get in there and she's going to basically let him know that let my son is my son and she'll find a bad reason to be right. In, right. But in the car, <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? You know, so she basically always was there for me. She made a fool out of herself at some times, but the, the mindset was basically 
to stick up for what she believed in. And I carry that mindset now a, a little bit more intellectually, you yeah. know, cause she came here from a foreign country, didn't speak any English. Um, and she, you know, she's a freaking survivor. And I realized, you know, my dad, he has like the outer shell and he has all the wisdom, the sayings, but fuck when it came down to the, the grit, the, the real fight, guts. Yeah. It's my fucking mom. Five kids. It, when you're in a land of, where you don't speak the native tongue and you're single. I mean, that's real guts. Yeah. That's, you know, that's not something that you can even really measure. That's legit. Cause I can't, I'm happily married with one kid and yeah. it's a mess. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine having five and being solo, not speaking the native tongue. It's yeah. Just, it's uh, it's funny when she yells at you, you, fuck shit. That's, that's real. It's funny you bring that up. Like, because I, I'm sure as a personal trainer, you deal with it a lot. You have a much different perception of discomfort compared to probably your average client, and it, and I know it does. It, it used to bug me more when we when Drew and I were on the radio five days a week, and people would call up with these questions. But now, just here and there on the Swole Patrol, people will call up and they'd be like, "I just can't stick to a diet, or I just can't." <laughs> I you know it it hurts when I lift weights or something. When you hear that as someone who really has a a, a real almost probably a a close relationship with discomfort. Um, Dieting for a show probably seems like baby shit to you, even though for most people, like for me, it drove it drove me crazy. I almost lost a marriage over it, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, there is a lot of understanding, though. I've been doing this for 20 years. And when people come in and they tell me, you know, first I ask them what their goals are. Yeah. And, and then I'll ask them why. And uh, most commonly, they want to lose a certain amount of weight. And it's I can really make myself look impressive by saying, why? Is that the time you remember yourself being in the best shape? They're like, yeah, how'd you know? Because that's always the case. That's always <laughs> that's the case. That's always what they want. That's a, yeah, they have, this, they, they have this memory of themselves like at a certain point. They also want to be 22. They, exactly, yeah, because <laughs> that's probably around the time that they yeah. felt that way. But then – You had a couple inches to my dick too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can I help you there? Um, but no, uh, I also prepare them – I can say yes, I can definitely help you, right? But I also tell them your goals are going to change. Once you realize that you you are able to reach a certain point, the human mind, man, just desires more. Oh, I want more. I want right. I want more. I want more. So, um I kind of uh, I can see the future a little bit and because of my past, I have developed and it runs in my family. We are very hypersensitive and intuitive. I am very good at reading people. Um, facial expressions. I give myself about an 80% accuracy. And the very fact that I've been staring at human bodies for now 20 years, yeah. facial expressions, sounds, um, uh, even even rituals, right? It allows me to understand that people are generally the same for the most part in regards to how they respond. So um, it helps me. It helps me know when to back off. It helps me know when to push forward. But part of being, in my opinion, a great fitness advisor is to understand that people have different, um, I guess you could say, uh, motives to keep them alive. And it's not always about, you know, intensity. Sometimes it's making them feel comfortable coming in saying you did something. Sometimes people just want to check off the box first. Yeah. And so you start there if that's what's desired. And sometimes people, they, they want the puke bucket. Which I, I I hate actually, you know it's uh, these cliche things you see people lying on a fucking floor and this, it interrupts the workout. Yeah, uh, it just <laughs> stops the workout. Yeah, you know it's it's the theatrics of bullshit yeah. that yeah. that irritates me. You know, there's a lot of pet peeves that you see just like on social media and these like and I and I don't want to sound like a negative person, but you can do it. And if I believe it, that's all crap. I don't believe in people. Yeah, I'll say that I, uh, for the most part. I believe that some people desire more than they want to work for. And when they realize what it takes, it's like, shit, yeah. hold on here. So when it comes to dieting, um, I don't choose. I don't, I'm not even a believer in free will for that matter. It just, it's a mindset or it's a click. I set uh, the, the I, I, I sign up for the show, boom, I have a date and it's just like, pew. And it's funny because you are literally starving yourself, but slowly. And I feel like this is like my own hypothesis. It's called this. I, I called it the uh, starvation mindset hypothesis. And okay. You, what's, it's what you referred to. So as you get lower in body fat, 
you tend to be more aggressive. Yeah. Right? You don't choose it. Jokes are not as funny. You're not as emotional. If your wife wants to touch you or rub you, it's just like your kind of, libido goes down. Yeah. yeah, it does. Right. But think about it. If you were starving from an evolutionary standpoint, mm-hmm. aggression would help you yep. in the hunt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So is my mind subconsciously preparing me for the hunt for survival? So it's I'm looking at myself from the outside. I'm thinking, damn, you know, I'm getting fucking pretty aggressive right now. And it fuels me, man, when I'm fucking tired. Yeah. I tell them I'm, I'm doing my repetitions. And I'm like 13, 14, 15, but I, I have 20 written down in my book. And I'm like, hey, you, but my body's hurting. Shut the fuck up or I'll yeah. make you do five more. Like you don't have a choice here. Oh, that's an interesting psychology most people don't have. Yeah. <laughs> right there. Yeah. yeah. It's like you, you're going to go. You don't tell me. You're going to go. And, you know, that's what, you know, it's funny. Speaking of clients, the most common compliment I get is you help me realize something that you help me realize I can do more than I can do. And I would love to take full credit. You know, I love receiving compliments, but in reality, it's it's low hanging fruit because they just needed a little push. Yeah. And then now they're like, damn, I can do this. Well, and it's a it's a real gift when you have a personal trainer that does that because so many people, they're just showing up. They just show up and they train their clients and they collect the, the check when when you have someone who's not only invested in the actual the analytics, you know the the weight to lift, the amount of reps, blah blah blah, but the the personal aspect of it and the personal side of it, and that's that's kind of what I was getting at when I asked you that is, um, so many people want to have a physique like yours, so few people are willing to do what it takes to have a physique like yours, yeah. And I think like, is there a secret? I don't want to say secret, but is there a a a special way in where where you can put the smelling salts in front of people's nose and say, look, no, seriously, this is what it takes. And if you're willing to do it, like I can take you there. But you know, you're gonna you're probably gonna die off half of your clientele when they realize just how how difficult it is. Because most people they want to have intuitive eating and just kind of they want to make a couple little sacrifices and get the results. But I, in I reality, would even argue, why would you even let anybody do that unless they wanted to be a competitor? Yeah. Right? It's uh, one of the best sayings that I've heard or read, I should say, is, you know, my, my sickness is my health. Now, bodybuilding is not healthy. But in reference to your question, um, sometimes people, like, I, I tell them, yeah, like, listen, this is not an easy thing. And I say I mean, people know me, like me, and dislike me for my forwardness. I don't believe that you can do it. Yeah, I don't think you're ready. And um, and and on both scales, because you have to get big sometimes too. So I have a client. She's a beautiful girl, um, and she comes in. She trains, and you know, she's very persuaded by you know other people that sound smart. You know, they put a few you know like good words together, and they're like, whoa. And she's like, yeah, he wants me to go on a surplus, meaning she wants me to add more calories. And I'm like, well. Listen, that's all good, but are you mentally prepared to see yourself get bigger, gain weight? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, you don't. Fu-. She goes, well, if I do, I'll stop. I go, listen, you'll stop, but then you're still left with that fat on you. Yeah. And she's the kind of girl. She wears these nice pointy shoes, these thin jeans. I'm like, I'm telling you, this is not a. F- this is one of the reasons why I'm not as a successful bodybuilder as some other people because I have, I will not get fat. I can't. It will – mentally, I don't have it in me and I will break myself even doing irrational things at some point, right? At, even at you know after all these years, you have this like emotional overset to your brain. It's like shit. When I remember when I got my hernia surgery, I was doing silent or invisible pitches. I was sitting down and I was below my belly button. I'm like pinching my stomach and no one can see that I'm doing this. And then I got up and my wife, Jessica, I'm like, Jessica, like, do, do I look fat? <laughs> you know, I went and I had to run a bunch of miles like – With a hernia. <laughs> no, I didn't have it then. I mean post, yeah, probably a little too early. But post-surgery, hernia surgery, you're in a lot of pain. Yeah, you are. And um, it, it's, uh, but it's weird how your um, – I guess you can say your – the mindset, whether it's secure or insecure, can drive you. And, you know um, – I, I believe to really be involved in this whole bodybuilding thing. I mean, anyone can compete. Anybody yeah. could. In fact, we just had a conversation, my brother and my wife and uh, his wife, like should overweight people be allowed to compete? Um, I don't think so. 
Right. Right. There should be a certain standard. And my wife's like, no, anybody could because you don't know their story. I was like, you know, that's a good point. I was like, but it can be on its own class. But it, there's like a certain standard where I'm like, you got to be a little compulsive, a lot compulsive, actually. You got to be selfish. Um, you have to be aggressive, right? It's, um, it's not something that you're going to be a very popular person. You become antisocial because, you know, it is shown that the more social you are, the more you eat. You know, yeah. humans gather around food. It's a way that we kind of gather around each other and like, well, I mean, think of holidays. We use Thanksgiving as like a turkey day, but you also see Thanksgiving around Christmas. Anytime you see like people come together, there's food. Absolutely. Right. And, and typically overeating. Correct. And uh, it's it's funny, though, because when you compete, I can't go far from my house. Yeah. OK, because like I'm on the clock right now. I have a bag of protein powder in my pocket right now. Drew, you like that? Yeah. <laughs> See? Bag of protein powder. We were talking the other – well, we were just talking the last show. It was a and a And I was saying, you know, people, they they want to know, what can I do? I, I'm so busy. I just can't get my meals in. I was like, mm, I have a hard time believing it. If you really wanted to, yeah. the reality is it doesn't matter that much to you because if you if it mattered enough, you would have Tupperware – you would have a bag of protein powder, whatever it took to get your meals. You know, I do like that clicking in concept. I think if you're OCD a little bit, right? Correct. Yeah, me too. And, yeah. and so when I when I do something, I'm, when I finally decide to do something, I'm aware there's a there's a shift. Yeah, it's like there's a click in, and then it's like I'm not fighting it. It's just going with it. Yeah, and it's it's a weird biology, I think. And I love it actually. Yeah. I, I I don't prefer to be in this mindset all year round. But it, it's not worth it's it. It's hard to get out of it once you're in it too, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> so. you know, I'm like 12 days out. So actually a, a good few meals, it's like, yeah. Yeah. But when people – even though I understand where you're coming from, when people suggest like there is no excuse, I don't think it's that easy. I don't think people have a choice. I, I really don't. I was lucky in some cases, specifically this, fitness, because humans desire fitness. I was lucky – um, to have a brain that desires something society accepts. Yeah, and, and and right, and had some of these other behavioral instruments you could use. Hey, we have a call. You want to take it real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John. John. Hey, guys. Hello? Can you hear me? You're, yeah, breaking, up like, you're up? breaking up like crazy. Oh, I'm in right now, so I'm calling you guys. Hey, Drew. I'm going to listen to you guys forever. You and Drew, Love Line, to now. Um, and I've been starting the whole keto, no sugar, no grain stuff from Vinny. And because I have down 45 pounds. Wow. Congratulations. Good man. for you. Yeah. Oh, we got to put him on. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, sorry call John. Us, call us back. Call us back. Call us Get back. a house phone. And a better connection. Well, <clears throat> I'm glad you uh, you brought up about the clicking in, Drew, and, I, and but, I'm but, sure and it is, you're and the it, most OCD and, guy I know. I know, so. and it's a bit it's, it's a bigger sort of sort of conversation o- overlays what what we were just talking about, which is that we're all different, sort of in our biology and physiology. You and I all, often talk about, it, but yeah. some of that is in terms of how we manage exercise and fitness and our structure sure. in our day and all this stuff. And, and some people it's a lot harder than it is. For oh, the absolutely. And that was that was my next question. And and um, you know it's hard. But but I would argue. Let me finish yeah. my thought, which is that the presence, your your ability to be totally present for your clients, I bet overcome some of that. Actually, it does. Yeah. Um, and yeah, people come in. I'm not accepted by all personalities. Right. Right. Um, I can see that. I, yeah. I teach a group fitness class and um you know there are times when my own family members take it and I, my ocd kicks in mm-hmm. and it's like i'm like hey, hey 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 no 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 because if it's not right i mean yeah, they, they get shamed by it and feel just dis- feel wounded and destroyed by it as opposed to you're telling me do 20 or going to do five more after that i'm like that that's right in my psychology i'm like oh okay i'll do 20 yes well, actually <laughs> so. it's, it's not even the specific number it's more of like if your back is not straight it's like it's it's messing with my head now and so to me, it's like exert. I, I always say I reward effort more than performance. Sure. And in the analogy I use is let's just say you have two people running up a hill, right? Uh, one person runs up the hill in, as, and he breaks the record or she breaks the record. The other person is overweight and they're barely making it. And they're – I mean they literally crawl to their knees and they're like getting back up. 
Like, w- w- the crowd resonates more with adversity. Yeah. yeah. And that's when you're like, go. I mean, you don't like Rocky because he just wins the war or the, the fight easily. Right. You like to see struggle and you like to see it overcoming because I have something I call Third Street Promenade. When you're walking down and you see these people doing amazing things on Third Street and you throw them a dollar, it's like fascinating. You might even throw some money at them, but you don't relate to it. Right. But when you see somebody struggle and continue to go, it's like you see effort. Hey, there's a reason why Robert Downey Jr. is the most successful actor in Hollywood today. You know, he's not the guy who was born beautiful and then just ascended right to the top of A. People don't know that story, though. Yeah, but but there but enough people do that he has surpassed. He's still even without making an Iron Man last year, one of the highest paid actors in all of Hollywood. You know, like you said, the people love the Rocky story. Yeah. Um, How do you think there's in a in any way? I I think a question for Mike and for Drew. Is there a way? For the people, because I just got a question from a girl via uh, Instagram. She said, my husband's a firefighter and he's and he's way into fitness. I just can't seem to motivate myself to be into it. Mm. How can you create the OCD mindset? How can you create the click? Is, is there a, or is it just something that some people have and some people don't? I think the latter. But, yeah. but, but you can motivate her for sure. Yeah. Um, there, I believe in some people they are fortunate to have the click. There is a motivating source out there. Um, there's a good chance, and I don't mean to overstep, that because her husband is very fit and things come easier, he might suggest certain things that make it seem easier. Where she and and not only that too, when they're a couple, it it doesn't usually work. Yeah, she and it's like okay, shut up. I don't want to hear it from you. The guy can say something to her, most likely, not all the time. And the stranger next door can say the same thing, and she's most likely going to absorb more of it. So delivery is a big deal in taking consideration that people do struggle. It, 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 people struggle with this, right? Um, and I don't like when people oversimplify people's struggles. I have – I don't like being inside of an airplane. Yeah, It's an irrational fear. And one thing I hate is when people are like – Oh, you know, just breathe. It's like, motherfucker, I'm not holding my breath. Sure. <laughs> don't don't reduce it by just telling me these like little things to do. So that's a great. That's no, honestly, that's a great point. Yeah. So and people do it far too often. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people have told me, "Why don't you just not drink?" Exactly. You know, why don't you it's just not same, same do drink? And I was like, well, it's same it's a little idea. bit more complicated. I, I remember when I was a kid, I had panic attacks, anxiety. It's like you get your act together. It's yeah. like, but oh my gosh. of course I would if I could do that. For yeah. God's sake. I think John's back. Let's see if we can get him here. John, you back? Yeah, you back? Can you hear me? Way, uh, way better. Go. Oh, good. Um, like I said, I, I lost 45 pounds in the whole no sugar, no grain. But my question is, like, how did I, I – I got a new job, and I've been traveling a lot for work. So, like, how do you guys do it with traveling? It's hard. I bring the elk bars. And now I'm going to get these protein. What are these? Pro- and I'll bring protein powder, like like we're hearing about today. Listen to, to Mike Safai over there as yeah. far as what he what he's having because there's nothing there's nothing comparable. Absolutely, let me be the. Fir- I will tell you this firsthand. There's nothing comparable to the demands of a di- the dietary demands of someone who's competing in a physique competition. So whatever this guy's eating, whatever this guy has to do, twelve days out. Yeah, but he's probably not going to start traveling for work in that window. It's a, but it, but it's to yeah. your point. But about, people do. But it's but to your do. point about Mike about preparing meals. You have to really prepare for this. You have to yeah. prepare ahead. And you're asking the question. Is a, this is a good place to start? So, John, can but I? But now, see? now, how bad is it that like, I've traveled and I've lost already forty five pounds and I. But when I travel, I'll be gone for three weeks, a month, and I'll come back drinking, eating whatever I want, and weighing the same weight. Is that bad or is that? Yes, it's bad. You're gonna, you're gonna, you, well, you will not say that way for long. Actually, uh, John, <laughs> can I ask I you a question? Come back the same weight, though. John, is your goal to lose yeah. more weight, or is your goal to maintain, not gain weight? Not gain weight and lose more weight. I start at two thirty-five. <laughs> And right now, I'm before I left my trip right now to England, I weighed in at one nine or one eighty seven, something like that. So like thirty eight pounds I lost. Okay, so if your goal is to can you so continue, 40, sorry. if your goal is to continue to lose weight, it you have to be in a deficit, meaning you have to be eating lesser calories than what's required to your overall um, energy requirements, and that's in a sense slow starvation. Um, 
Now, the, one of the reasons why you're not gaining weight is because at the end of the day, the, 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 if it fits your macros, it's going to be beneficial. So the cutting the carbs out and the grains is – and I don't mean to reduce your work at all, but it, it was just an easy decision for you to make selections as to how you eat. You're not counting your calories. You're just basically by eliminating those sources, you're you're reducing your calories. So it's the reduction of calories that's helping you. So um, when you go out and you eat and you drink, there's a good chance if you're not even eating enough that that might actually be helping you in regards to uh, spiking your metabolism for you know the two to three days at a time. So um, it's a hit or miss. There's a little bit of guessing into it, but – you uh, you basically kind of – if you continue the path that you're on and you make the best of making food choices towards your diet principle being that it's on ketogenic – it's ketogenic, the idea is this. You, you think about this. Um, the, if, if you create enough momentum within your diet, uh, swaying off track a little bit won't deter you. Maybe some water weight – Right, water. Uh, every carbohydrate holds about attracts about almost three grams of water. So you don't really know. At the end of the day, a scale is not the most accurate way. But if you're going up and down, and your your goal is just to lose weight, um, I wouldn't be too concerned if you gain a few pounds or even subside a little bit, as long as you continue to track and move down towards your goal. Okay. There, there you go, brother. Yeah. Thanks, John. That's a good point, too, that uh, I want to point out to people. A lot of people, uh, they get blinded in keto ideology where they think it's magic. But you you make – I think a lot of people need to hear this. There's nothing against ketogenic diets. There's nothing against paleo or whatever. But in the end, what is forcing you to lose weight is the calorie reduction. Correct. And if, if you seek calorie reduction through lower carbohydrates or if you – through lower fat, whatever it may be, however you get there – in the end, it's the calorie reduction that gets you your result. Correct. The uh, the protein, though, is the one you don't want to mess with. Yeah. And the reason why is because protein. Um, I mean, we don't we don't store it. I mean, muscle is your stored protein, basically. So you the like the bodybuilding world is very interesting because you know these people aren't decorated like educated people, and they don't have a plaque on their wall. Yeah. But the anecdote of their experiences speaks volumes. And you learn a lot. I mean, you because it's interesting. If you if you study to help others versus studying to help yourself, studying to help yourself, you absorb a lot more information. Yeah. Right. And it, it's it's a twofold thing. You know, we need both to exist in the world. I always use this example. Imagine like a person that has cancer. Right. There's the the doctors that you listen to, but then there's also the recovering the people that have recovered from sure. cancer. You respect both. Right. So, Absolutely. In my world, in the world of drug addiction, yeah. I, I, I am a recovering drug addict. I respect Dr. Drew's opinion, of course, and I want to hear everything he has to say from the biological aspects of my disease. But I, you better believe the people I meet in meetings, other drug addicts are the people that I listen to with just as much weight, if not more. You know? Yeah, exactly. So there's – you know, I have my people that I learn from that I'm like – my – it's – I'm continuously like trying to absorb information. But then I also have myself – I have my brother. I have my sister. I mean, we will not only just discuss, but evil family arguments is like, does does this matter about your diet or does that matter? Yeah. Like, we can really- tell me about your leptin set point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> straight up. So it's so funny too. I just you know we have these ideas and stuff that we kick around with each other. Um, but yeah, ultimately you're correct. Um, the reduction of calories is why people are losing weight. Protein is something you as if you care about your muscle, right? Yeah. Sometimes people don't care, man. They just want to look good. A lot of chicks. They just want to lose weight. They just they want, don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just they won't really. And it, it's it's so funny too because sometimes I hear some of these quote unquote experts, and they are experts. I don't want to say that, but I don't feel like they understand the human side of things. It's just let them do that first. I love the the Weight Watchers program. Yeah. It fucking works. Yeah. It, because that might be the gateway to the next step. Right. Don't you don't necessarily embrace it and saying oh this is the whole perfect thing but it's like oh cool my mom my, my mom wants nothing to do with my life yeah she can't stand the way my, my sister is like a holistic freak like super like oh my god that's not organic lettuce i'm not eating it right and 
Sounds like my wife. Oh, mm-hmm. and it's it's too much. Yeah, uh, and that's actually a red flag, by the way. Anybody that's overly concerned from a moral standpoint, not moral like for their food, there's like you got to watch that. Yeah. Right. My mom doesn't like to listen to her. Yeah, because she just she has to regurgitate information that she hears, and it's useful and it helps her. My sister's in incredible shape, but my mom's not at a point to where she can absorb that. Sometimes people don't want to like experience this reflection. But me, I'm like, and they may not be at that level. I mean, someone who's 200 pounds overweight, they want to get in better shape. You, you're going to treat that client a lot different than someone who's eight percent wanting to get down to four. Correct. You know, and their mindset. Yeah. You know, uh, I had an overweight client. He was obese, and uh, man, this guy was a fast talker, and um, he was he was awesome. He he lost so much weight, he had to get his skin cut. Yeah, that's big know? time. But. You know, he had the mindset. He just needed the right person to help him and so on. So um, it just depends who the person is and your ability to acclimate to their personality is what's going to define success. It's a good point to take a break. Our guest is Mike Safai, at Mike Safai on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, and we will be right back. Well, you know how I love our friends at Hydrolyte. Uh, look, even if you're training indoors, dehydration is a real issue. Amateurs, pros, we all have it. Water and sports drinks do not do enough for rehydration. I strongly suggest you stay ahead of your hydration with Hydrolyte. The best way to stay hydrated was the proper balance of glucose, sodium, and water. And Hydrolyte does this better than anything else out there, I'm telling you. Everyone swears by it. Everyone in the training community, it, it just does it better and does it without as much calories. And it does it faster. And, uh, you know, whether it's rehydration, uh, recovery from exercise or illness, whatever it is, I've been recommending it to family, friends, uh, patients, other physicians. It comes in great flavors like orange berry and lemonade and is available as a premixed drink, powder, or my personal preference, the effervescent tablets. You simply drop in a glass of water. Certainly, the Pinsky family does not leave home without them, literally. Compared to sports drinks, Hydrolyte delivers up to four times the electrolytes with 75% less sugar. The solutions are appropriate for all ages, and each bottle or package includes easy-to-follow dosing instructions. So you can find Hydrolyte at Rite Aid or at Hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. And for a limited time, our listeners save 30% on Hydrolyte. Just click the banner on their website at drdrew.com. Use the code Dr. Drew 18 at checkout. That's Hydrolyte.com slash D-R-D-R-E-W. And use the checkout code Dr. Drew 18. Yes, welcome back to the Swole Patrol podcast at Mike Safai, uh, Safai, I should say, and that is S A F A I E S A F F A I E. That is at S at Mike S A F F A I E on Twitter and on A-I-E? Instagram. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. On Twitter and on Instagram, um, we're talking a little bit uh, about um, kind Every- of diets that work and diets that don't work for given everybody's kind of different temperament and i'm glad that we've got on to that discussion because it's not just about calories in calories out and about people's biology it's also about the temperament some people are just not it's but it's interesting that it doesn't sound familiar to the addiction phenomenon absolutely because we're talking about appetitive drives yes that's really what addiction is it's a disorder of appetitive drive yeah and eating has its own spectrum of disorder around well, the appetite of element. And Drew, you've talked about it so many times that certain mental afflictions um, have their they're beneficial in certain ro- mm, aspects OCD. of life. OCD, OCD is is, is where we're seeing this become incredibly it's incredibly relevant to dieting and to yeah, and to bodybuilding in particular. ADHD as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah. they're, they're related anxiety yeah. that's why you have the plane problem. Anxiety, yeah. ADD, OCD, they all kind of dovetail in a lot of ways. It's really helped me. Yeah. <laughs> what what is your take though, uh Mike? I, I heard you uh discuss it a little bit uh on your Instagram uh, a while back and I, I it stuck with me that there's look, there's fu- there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do it. Yeah. Okay? And intuitive ideas, they're just not going to cut it when it comes down to there's a there's an X's and O's way to get things done um, when it comes to dieting. It probably circles back to the calories in, calories out, but but uh, just touch on that if you could a little bit. Well, a lot of people have this uh, misconception that eating healthy, right, is going to help them look aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, and it's not the case. Yeah, and there are studies out there. Um, that they can look up. Uh, I believe uh, one teacher f- ate 2,000 calories from McDonald's purely, and he lost 30 pounds, mm-hmm. right? And some people are like, well, what about his insides? His LDL went down, his HDL went up, right? It didn't have 
any type of adverse effects. Um, another teacher ate two thirds of his calories from Twinkies and another type of dessert, right? And same, same basically indication, like a lot of parallels. So the holistic side of gut health is really coming out. So it's, it's a little bit beyond my ability to explain. So I'm not going to say that there are zero adverse effects. But when we talk about just the common low hanging fruit, you know, my six pack, my muscle and so on, or losing weight to look aesthetically, not for the, not for stage. Um, At the end of the day, it has nothing to do – not nothing. It has very little to do with uh, these – I eat my kale yeah. or I have my spinach, lemon, ginger, blah, blah, blah <laughs> drink. It's crap. It's all freaking crap. And I like to show my foods sometimes within this preparation to show like, listen, I'm eating french fries. Yeah. I'm eating hamburgers. I'm eating potatoes. I'm eating pasta throughout my prep, Right. The reason why I change it towards the end is because you want to – you want more volume because it's shown that volume makes you full. Yeah. It gives you the full feeling because that's what you need. And like, when a guy your size is on 1,300 calories, you better have some fucking volume. Right? You know what's yeah. interesting? I I haven't gone below 1,900. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I haven't gone below 1,900. My protein right now is about 1.3 per pound. Um, and the reason why is because my, for my activity level, 1,900 is really low. But – like I just did my uh, some cardiovascular training today, some outdoor training, and I freaking killed it. Yeah, you know, and your body, your body adapts to um, adapt. Body adaptation occurs when you're on a low caloric diet for a certain period of time, and you want to offset that. Yeah, you don't want to stay there. But refeeds, you, refeeds, another thing that you uh, yeah. seem to be a, a really have an, an expertise understanding of. I wouldn't um, say that. Uh, I have a. I have a very. It's you either understand it or you don't. Right, and that, well, that's yeah. my point is that you clearly do. Yes, um, and some people look at refeeds as cheat days, or or cheat man, and it's not. It's, the two aren't necessarily the same. They may have some crossover, but they're really not the same. They 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 their attempt to in, in regards to the meaning is the same. That I just don't like this idea of calling it cheat because. Um, Lyle McDonald said it the best. There is no morality in your calories. Right. You're not doing <laughs> something wrong. Yeah. You know, you are basically attempting to increase your metabolic rate by or your fat burning rate by your leptin. So how do we do that? Well, we don't necessarily know for sure. We just know that there's a relationship between increasing calories to maintenance, increasing carbohydrates, and anywhere between one to three days, Right. When you combine those together, you have to see how you work in that sense. So you, I mean, I, I can show you. Like I have my, I weigh myself every single day, and you can see sometimes when I'm at a halt, I'll not exercise, I'll eat more, and then in two days because you retain water, my weight drops. Boom. So um, this is what I mean. It's the anecdotal side of things that you have to take in consideration to where you know how you work for the next time. Because I, I, I made a decision last year that I'm going to compete at least once a year to keep me in shape. I mean, I'll be 40 years old in June. And it's just a good I, – I really believe that it's just a good way to hold yourself accountable to a process, mm-hmm. right? So learning that, you really get into – because you kind of let this go. When it's not like a on the forefront of your mind, you don't really kind of pay attention to it. You know, if someone brings it up, you kind of – but now I'm in it. I'm like, okay, how do I get better? How do I get better? Okay, leptin. Okay, listen to this. Listen to it again. Rewind, rewind. Like, so it's really right here right now. Um, and so, yes, I do have cheat days. Um, however, this is the interesting part of things. So there's the irrational side of fear. And, and bodybuilders deal with this, man. It's fear versus knowledge. Okay. Okay. You are fighting against what you know is true. There's just too much to fucking lose by these little stupid shows. Yeah. Right? So I looked at myself this morning. And I'm like, God damn. And I'm, my wife said, I'm like, look, take a picture, you know? I'm like, I don't want to lose it. Fuck. I'm not like, why would I lose it? Today was supposed to be a refi day. I didn't do it. I'm oh, 12. yeah. You know what I mean? That's I'm, the neuro- I, That's I, the anxiety. I, yes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's the that's cra- my husband, that's, too. That's the craziness. Yes. I know. I'm familiar with that. Yeah. So here's the – even when I started this, it's funny. Last year, I, uh, I was like all in mode. I realized it took about four weeks until I started washing the dishes and doing all these things. The nuances of preparation that we, people don't see, things that I hate, right? And 
it's it, it's interesting. When I first started this year, I'm like, wait, a minute. wait, how would I do this? <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, I'm the fucking expert here. Yeah. Now I want to go just try to tell these people, oh, yeah, just go do this, just measure your food. Right. It's like, no, hold back, bro. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. And it's hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's hard. But just your appreciation of that in your clients would be massively important. And it, yeah, it show. I'm very patient in some cases, and then the OCD can turn on in different ways. You want to hit something up real quick before we wrap this up, Drew? Yeah, there's somebody that uh, on Facebook that was asking about weight gain from psychotropic medications. And, and I'm telling you, this is a very common thing. Certain psychiatric medicines reset your appetite centers just at a, just a slight increase above normal, but you're constantly then bringing in more calories. And right. You, it's a reset. Those people, it's extremely difficult for them. They have to pay. They have to be like you, paying attention, or they can gain fifty pounds really easily. Hard to get it off, though. Getting off the meds helps get it off. So I'm just bringing it up. But that was the question. I hope it's not Wellbutrin or Abilify. Uh, it's not Wellbutrin. Okay. Wellbutrin uh, typically doesn't do that. Abilify, it has not been my experience, especially yes. at lower dose. All right, so, good. good. So, you know, an easy way to um, do you like Abilify? I. I enjoyed it. It, it you're still on it oh, i've just upped it too okay just it's, it's it. working for you it, it seems to be i'm Good. happy today yeah because because it, uh, <laughs> it's a medicine that has begun much more widely I, I was around during the early days it's of the most prescribed drug in america right now uh, it, that's what worries me when psychiatrists start piling in on medicine i'm going oh boy and the most prescribed drug in america is an antipsychotic that makes me go hmm yeah but it's not just an antipsychotic it's, it's a mood stabilizer and it's enhances antidepressant effect that's, yeah. that's what they're going with it's that's, a novel it's a yeah. novel drug i really liked it Adderall. Adderall was. I mean, I'd love some Adderall, but I'm a fucking <laughs> drug addict. Drug I can't have any. You know, it's yeah, it's interesting because. Oh. Hey, now I'll get it. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's our next next guest oh. calling in <laughs> for Zoom. Sorry. All right. I'll tell him to hold on. <laughs> no, finish your thought though. I'm sorry. No, I was saying. Um, so I took Adderall for a year, and I remember I. I it, prior to that, I was afraid because I listened to all you know the the street science people like, oh, yeah. it's legal speed, this that, and I was, yeah. and I'm prone to anxiety. Yeah. And uh, it's one chemical away from speed. I'm like, yeah. fuck, take away, you know, hydrogen from H2O. What do you have? <laughs> it's you, you can do that with any. Supply. It's true. It's a very reasonable p- way to look at it. I took it and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is awesome. I didn't have any of these like common cliche things. My appetite wasn't wasn't affected. The only thing that kind of was affected was my sleep. And the best way I can describe it, if, if deep sleep is like swimming to the bottom of three feet, mm-hmm. I was like at the top. I wasn't in a deep sleep. Did you um, – did anything else? Did you want it more? Did you want to you know, take it? I actually – there was a point where I caught myself. Yeah, the wanting is what you have to watch out yes, for. Yes, I, I caught myself wanting the yeah. peak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a, not a good thing. Correct. For, yeah, that's the part. You know, but but nicotine – I mean, excuse me, nicotine, caffeine. Yes. Also good, right? Oh, my God. I'm like, <laughs> so. And it's so funny. I'm a, I'm a stimulant junkie. Yeah. Not this time around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I also was looking at my blood pressure and I, w- I started at, at – before I was at 104. Then I was like 138 and I was like, I don't want to be a smart dead person. Was that on the Adderall? Yes. Yeah. So I stopped it. Yeah. And man, I'll tell you, I, I went from waking up and – I mean, just you ready to it. attack the world. Yeah. And my first day off, I remember I leave the house. All right, bye, baby. And then two seconds later, I forgot my keys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Fog. Yeah. It's, that's the unfortunate side effect to, to any stimulant. But, you know, man, they're good. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was awesome. Uh, and Mike, Safi, honestly, uh, it was a pleasure talking to you, man. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure being here, guys. I enjoyed it. Good and uh, I, wish you, I wish you the best in 12 days, man. Thanks. Yeah. Where's your show? It's in Culver City. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I'm, right on my neck of the woods. I'm going to kill. I'm working freaking very hard for this. I can't see anybody beating you. I got to be honest. I've seen your, your photos of you training your back that you yeah. put up today. I was like, <laughs> who's going to beat this? This is ridiculous. I can't think that way. I have to feel that. No, no. I hear yeah. you. I hear just, you. Just, yeah. Also, for you grapplers out there, the Grapple Grip, a product that Mike uh, has brought to my attention, excellent, excellent training tool. It's essentially a, a, a handle that you can attach to different cables and other workout devices. You can hang from it, and it mimics a, a gi, and it really does help strengthen those small wrist, muscles in your, in, your, in your wrist and your um, – in your hands and your fingers that we all know if you train jujitsu that those are the some can be some of the most important muscles in your body so uh, the grapple grip check that out mike uh the best place to get in touch with him is on twitter instagram also his youtube channel is excellent and filled with a lot of good mm. advice and anecdotal stuff so uh it's um, mike spelled normally and safai s-a-f-f-a-i-e there you go thank you thank so you much guys see you next time thank you 
Hey everybody, it is the Swole Patrol Podcast. You can find me on Twitter at Mike Catherwood and Dr. Drew is at Dr. Drew, of course. Join the email list today. Send your questions, drdrew.com slash contact and put Swole at the top of the email so we can get your comments. And this will get you a weekly email reminder with a link to this show and all the great shows that Dr. Drew and I do and all the shows that Dr. Drew does by himself and, of course, with Adam Carolla, the great ace man. Please tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes. Don't forget to rate us five stars. And on Podbean or Google Play, all three help us out. We also are on YouTube slash Dr. Drew, and I uh, hope you can give us all your comments, even if they're if you're a troll and you want to destroy our feelings and our emotions. Support our sponsors and the show. Click on the banners on drdrew.com for the links for special discounts for the products Dr. Drew and I endorse 100%. Send questions and comments to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Swole Patrol Podcast, or on Twitter at Swole Patrol Pod. And uh, be good. Be swole. Hashtag Swole Patrol.